This is the OFN Today on the Orlads Football Network as we talk Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl football. That's right. We get to say that since the Chiefs are Super Bowl victorious. Why not? I'm a Washington National fan, so I know how it feels to be a Chief fan. And we're going to do that with Ryan Tracy, Rogue Analytics, founder and host of the Locked On Chiefs podcast. Ryan, good to talk to you again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Yeah, we, it's nice to, it's nice for the Chiefs. You're pretty much the champ until you're not the champ, I, right? That's what I say. And especially like the Nationals, the way I look at it, this mess that got going on here in baseball, that doesn't count. So <laughs> the, we, we, the Nationals are still the defending champs next year. That's all, as far as I'm concerned, that's all that matters. <laughs> all right, so let's get uh, let's get going here. And last time, of course, we, we talked mostly analytics, but here we get an opportunity to talk about the Chiefs. Uh, how long, by the way, have you been with the Locked On Network? Uh, since its inception here, going uh, just over four years now. And we've got uh, shows for every NFL team, every Major League Baseball team, colleges, hockey, a little bit of everything. Very nice. And if you do it every day, the Chiefs uh, programming? Yeah, we're a daily show, about 20, 25 minutes, you know, something you can eat on the commute, basically. Very cool. All right. So uh, Chiefs didn't – there weren't a lot of moves to make cap-wise. And then again, as long as you don't lose a lot of players and you're coming off a Super Bowl, then, you know, it probably shouldn't be a whole lot of movement. And there weren't. Of course, the Chiefs did lose several key veterans. And matter of fact, the top free agent addition, uh, cap-wise, was Mike Remmers making a whopping <laughs> $1.18 million. So, yeah. yeah that's uh, And he's not even a starter. So uh, No. He will be the sixth he guy. Will. Uh, he'll be the... The utility that he'll go inside, outside. I don't think he'll take or make snaps, but that's about the only spot I don't think he'll fill. But it's also a little misleading, too, because it, it that sounds like they weren't very active. Sure. But while they didn't make a lot of additions, they got everybody signed back. They're returning 20 of 22 starters and would have had more had it not been for an opt-out due to the COVID situation. So while it seems low-key, the front office was very, very busy this offseason. And, and that's uh, and that's probably I should have um, made the point a little bit better. That's that's what you want to do again as a Super Bowl champ. You you want to have that uh, that cohesion from building within keeping your guys. And why, why don't you want to keep your guys when you win a Super Bowl championship and you have a lot of young players, including your quarterback? So which was yeah. the biggest one of all. Uh, let's talk about the offensive line because that that's the one on offense where there's a little bit of movement. Of course, one of the opt outs, that's where it is on the offensive line. Mm -hmm. Kalechi assembly comes in. Now he's going to take over at left guard. Is that the case? Yes, it is. Okay. And I know assembly was with the jets last year, me being a jet fan. So I understand the situation there wasn't very good. There was a little injury deal there. Just didn't work out. Uh, but apparently I, I, I would guess he's healthy again and ready to go. It, it certainly seems that he's had a couple of days off here or there where he uh, had some slight soreness, that kind of thing. And it's somewhere between not just the shoulder joint itself, but up in the neck as well. Okay. Um, and that leads me back to the jet situation. Like I, I wanted to ask you, what was it uh, a lack of consensus on the diagnosis or was it pressure to play so they could try to, protect sam or it was or there was, was a the difference, difference a difference in yeah. yeah the prognosis that's just really what it was and I, and uh you know to me it's one of those things where i got the feeling that you know maybe things could have worked out if i don't know it's almost like I, I it was interesting too because he came in he's he and as you as you could tell already he, he you know he he represents himself really well he, he he did a good job of going on radio shows and talking about himself and 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 what he's going to do to help the Jets. So everything was heading in the right direction. But as soon as the injury deal came up, I don't know. It I see this a lot in the NFL with veterans, especially when they come to losing teams. That when there is an injury situation, I tend to wonder whether or not. It's almost like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to push this thing. This isn't, it's not worth it. Maybe this wasn't the right move for me. 
Um, so I just don't, I think it's, so bottom line is I just think, yeah, there was a disagreement in the prognosis, but everything else before seemed like it was a nice pickup, a nice veteran pickup. He seems like a really good team guy, but, I, but we have to go back to the Raiders too. And that really wasn't a, a good marriage as you remember when it ended. So I don't know, there's maybe something about Kassembly that, uh, we don't know about, but he's a good football player. Yeah, and I, I think that really remains to be seen exactly like I said, like there's been this history. Does that change? Does he fit in here? Is is it the same reaction on a team that should be pushing for at least a playoff run, if not another return to the championship game? Um, does that change the perspective too? Because it isn't the perfect fit. Uh, I would say that his game is based more on, on a power blocking scheme. Uh, he, he doesn't do the things that Andy Reid wants it to do in terms of getting in space as well on screens, getting downfield. So it's definitely not a, a round peg and a round hole, but I think they're trying to adapt. And I want to see if that goes smoothly or if, if you get in that situation again. All right. And uh, Kilgore was also picked up. So he's going to add depth mm -hmm. along the line. Uh, Wiley is the starting right guard. Was, 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 was there any competition with Wiley? He took every training camp snap at right guard, as far as I'm aware. Okay. Um, now, obviously, I'm not in the, the credential pool that was there to, to watch, but that's my understanding. And it actually fades into the, the move from where he was at left last year over to the right, because we've seen him fill in in this situation before where Laurent Duvernay Tardif got hurt a couple of days uh, years ago. Uh, he filled in better, honestly, on the right-hand side than he did on the left. So I think the fit was there. And in the end, I think the younger guys and Kilgore actually hasn't really put any any practice time in yet. So that it hasn't become a competition. I think he will start as, as the backup there. And maybe that changes during the season. We'll have to and, see. And uh, where's Allegretti's, Allegretti's future? You know, they seem to want him as a backup center. They've they've tried him mixed around. Obviously, he played tackle in college. I really like him as a guard. He is very tall, and I, I think his pad level in college really told you that he needed to work on on getting that down, uh, getting his rear down, being able to, to drive a little bit better. They seem to be happy with that. So if there's an injury, I'd rather see Kilgore move in at the center spot and let Allegretti come into the right guard mm -hmm. spot. Okay. All right. Uh, as far as the running game is concerned, it's about the first-round draft pick, Edwards Hilaire. Uh, who just seems like a perfect fit for this offense. Yeah, he's he's probably the best fit in the last five years of any player to scheme scenario. I uh, really like what he's doing, and they're they're taking their time with it. They're very happy with Daryl Williams, who put in a lot of good snaps for them last season. They feel he's come along as well, and so they're going to treat them as a one-two punch, and I think it might end up being a little bit more of an even split here early in the season than most people are expecting, they want to work Clyde in a little bit slowly, work on the pass pro, work on not wearing him out and try to avoid that rookie wall. So Daryl Williams is the number two. Okay. Yes. And uh, what about, let's see, the team also added DeAndre Washington. Is he still trying to make the team? Is he, is he battling with Elijah McGuire and Darwin Thompson? Not so much with Elijah McGuire. I expect him to be a practice squad player at the most. Um, it is – Thompson and Washington that are really back and okay. forth. And I have a tendency to think that they'll, they'll keep four on the roster because they've seen uh, players fall off at the running back position the last few years. I think they're a little wary of that, but if not, I, I personally would give the nod to Washington due to his experience, but we'll have to see. Okay. At wide receiver, the big two, Tyree kill and Sammy Watkins, uh, Demarcus Robinson, of course, has had a big hand in, uh, in this offense the last few years, Hardman last year, so they're pretty set with the, with the top four. Uh, everything, mm -hmm. everybody's healthy. Everything looks good, and and that includes Kelsey. If we want to obviously throw him in, he's uh, he's the best tight end in football right now. I absolutely agree. No, no offense to George Kittle, but I'm with you. Yeah. So uh, backups, and that's where things are different. Uh, a yeah. tight end more than anything, because if anything were mm -hmm. to happen to Kelsey, wow, that is a huge, huge loss. And I'm kind of surprised. But then again, you know, when you don't have a cap space and you're and you're limited, there's only so many holes you can fill. Uh, but uh, they haven't tried to add that next young backup to Travis Kelsey in case anything did happen to him. Um, 
But they did sign Ricky Seals Jones. So that's kind of like their backup plan, I would guess, for right now. Do they have a clear number two? They do. And it is Ricky Seals Jones. Uh, he had a couple of hiccups in training camp where he had to miss some practices. But in terms of fitting within the offense and being the tight end that can really split out into the slot or even farther out in Kelsey's case, uh, there really isn't much of a comparison between uh, Kaiser. Nick it would be the number three and Ricky Seals Jones. So right now you can probably run your two tight end set, be able to spread everybody out five wide if you need to uh, with Ricky a little bit better than you can with Nick. But I think they're very pleasantly surprised with Nick Kaiser's progression. Uh, and he's clearly number three at this point. Uh, and that helps because they got a couple of good games uh, in very limited snaps out of Dion Yelder last year, uh, but he's been hurt this entire preseason so i expect him to go to the, the practice squad and be available if they really need will him. they keep three quarterbacks i don't think so i think it's going to be two and you might see at least one but maybe even two onto the practice squad andy reed's very intrigued by what jordan tom can do uh and he has trust in both chad henny and matt moore so i expect it could be a, a four quarterback kind of thing for a while uh, as far as the depth at wide receiver how does it round out? What's the competition look like after the top four? It's pretty clear that Byron Pringle out of K-State is the next guy on the totem pole. He actually put in some good snaps. Um, he was a key block on that last touchdown in the Super Bowl. He does more of the dirty work and the special teams work, as you would expect for a fifth wide receiver. He's also come up with some really nice catches in spots. Uh, one of Mahomes' highlight throws last year deep into the end zone was a comeback route that he had to adjust to. I think he's a guy that's still got upside to achieve, and, and they're working on that. And then the sixth one is the open competition. Um, a guy coming out of nowhere uh, in Jody Fortson has made a push this this camp season, uh, but had a lot farther to go. And I think that he's, he's working on the offensive side, but is a little raw on the special teams aspect of it. Okay. And so they brought back Marcus Kemp, who has played a lot of special teams for them, is one of Dave Tobe's favorites. Uh, and those two seem to be the competition for the sixth. And okay. I think at the end of the day, it'll end up being Kemp just because they need somebody to cover kicks. All right. Let's move over to the defense now. And uh, let's uh, tell you what, let's start with the secondary because this is, this is a secondary that of course, Thornhill was a really good pickup last year in the second round. I was a big fan of his at Virginia and everything. I mean, he actually even played a lot better and quicker than I thought he would. Uh, but he's a great ball hawk. Uh, didn't, get to finish the season, but they'll get him back. Uh, how is it looking right now with Fenton, another player in last year's draft in the sixth round that seems to have a bright future? So on paper, you take a look at this team, and you're probably going, I don't, what, what is this? Who, who are these guys? Uh, but you tell me as far as how it looks, because Ward was also, and we talked about this last time, that that was a, a really nice trade uh, that the Chiefs swung to, Acquire him. Uh, so it, it, they don't have any top draft picks or big time money spent at the position, but the kids that are there are getting the job done. And they also added a couple of draft picks this year. They did. And, and it, it goes to show you that there's a pretty clear shift in the mentality from wanting quality corners or ex exceptional corners. Uh, to try to cover that up with better play at safety. They're, they've got a heavy investment into the safety, not only in the draft picks. Thornhill was actually top on my draft list coming out, and I think he's lived up to it to this point. He needs to get his hands on a few more passes, and I think that's definitely something he's spoken about this preseason and as one of his goals. And he's also the only guy that I, I truly feel is a true free safety that can be left there single high all game long if you need to. The rest of them all kind of are this mush secondary where they can do a little bit of everything. They have a lot of, of holes to fill. You can put Ward on one side. Fenton's really nice. Fenton's a little bit exposed to long speed, as is Bashar Breland, who will be out for the first four games. But so that leaves you a bit, little bit lacking in some of the field stretchers and having to cover them, which again brings into the safety play. But they do have a couple of those rookies. Uh, and while Fenton is clearly... Uh, a nasty kind of a, a guy that plays with good attitude, and that's something that they look for. So is Legereus Sneed out of La Tech, and uh, another kid that's got really long arms. He does have long speed, sub 4-4, four, four, and he can play the, the press pretty well. They're very happy with that so far. I think he will get the nod in Bashad Breland's absence until week four. 
And then they have Bo P. Keys out of Tulane, a guy that's coming along. And as of today, they still have a couple of even UDFAs that are interesting, like Levert Hill from Michigan. Okay. And uh, what about uh, Antonio Hamilton? Hamilton is the wild card. Um, being from New York, you've seen him play for the Giants, but not much on defense, right? The, the Chiefs seem to like his, obviously his athleticism, but his versatility as well. They're looking for him to be a gunner, and they're looking possibly to see if they can mold him into uh, the Kendall Fuller type paradigm where he can do a little bit of everything, play some middle safety, play some nickel, give you some snaps when you need them, not necessarily as a starter, but as a fill-in. And I think if that's what it boils down to, they might be all right. Okay, so at this point, what are we looking at? Like Ward and Fenton are definitely starters. Who who would, yes. who would Is there a clear leader as far as the slot corner it is, it is fenton. fenton okay so, so who's the third corner right he now if greenland inside. is out uh the rookie legerius Sneed Sneed. is the guy so sneed is gonna and you know it's interesting too i mean breeland's a uh, you know is a, is a is a decent option and he's a veteran mm-hmm. decent player but i think the chiefs would definitely want to see, i mean if sneed can can this is one of those opportunities you get when a guy's out, suspension, injury, take advantage of it. Uh, and I think that would be the best case for the Chiefs that Steed plays well enough that maybe he can keep Breland, you know, kind of off the field a little bit more than uh, he was on the field for last year. I agree. That would be great if that's the way that it worked out. But I think the team will be very happy if they can just get him four games of experience early. <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. And if Bashaw gets back, Bashaw is one of those – He's a crafty player is the way I would put it. He makes plays that maybe he shouldn't be able to make, but he finds a way to come up with them. I think they look for that, and they lean, I think, towards experience more so than upside uh, at the corner spot because they feel they have the safety play over the top. So I'd love it if you got four games, and then he can kind of take a break and get to the point where he can learn a little bit more vicariously through Breland, then I think you're absolutely right. He may make a push either late in this season or certainly And what's good about Breland and even Ward, but they are also good against the run game, and that's something that is very important, Uh, something that doesn't get looked at enough uh, with corners. Uh, Look, if you're making plays and you're a really good – and and that's usually what separates the – the great corners. I mean, Deion Sanders might be the only guy that I remember that was a great corner that couldn't tackle, you know, my grandmother, that kind of deal. <laughs> but usually the great corners can do everything. You know, they can they can not only cover and pick off passes, but they could also do uh, do a really good job in the run game and they're physical. And and uh, and that's that's where Ward and Breland, uh, that's 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 what they add to the table as well. Absolutely. And Ward's made progress. He he didn't come to the team in that situation where we felt he would stick his face in there against the run and really come up with big plays. So it goes towards the concept that they're looking to grab these guys with athleticism that can be backups for a while, coach them up, get them to that point. And I, I think Ward is really the model of what they're looking to do. All right, let's talk uh, about the linebackers. Uh, linebacking play really last year uh, wasn't – wasn't the reason that the Chiefs defense wasn't the top reason that the Chiefs defense uh, had success. So now you, you look here and look, they went after gay and it made sense that they went after a player early in the second round. No question at that position. And, uh, and there was some, I don't know, skepticism about whether or not that was too high of a pick. There were a lot of scouts that felt that was right on. Um, mm-hmm. I know our leads felt he should have been a little bit further down, but that doesn't matter. It matters about the system you're running and the team that believes that you fit their system and you're the guy. And that's what the chiefs thought. He's the second round pick. What have you heard so far about Willie Gay jr? By all accounts, he is exactly what they banked on uh, a high end athlete for the position and a guy that brings some edge to the table, that brings some nasty to the table. There's been a lot of talk about coaching him up on blitzing, about getting him coming forward, even though probably his best aspect on college film was playing backward, playing in coverage, which they definitely are lacking at the linebacker level. So it's interesting that they chose to bring him in, and the concentration seems to have been on 
adapting his weakness rather than playing up his strength into the defense. So that tells me that they feel that he's pretty solid there and that, that he can be a contributor early. Now, I'm not sure that he starts in the base at a will, but certainly in a nickel position with Anthony Hitchens, I think he's got to be on the field and got to be there. And early. the Chiefs really are, they play two, mostly two, two linebackers, what, a 4 2 5 most of the, the time? For the vast yeah. majority. And uh, Dor Dorian O'Daniel was a third round draft pick. That hasn't seemed to work out at this point. You know, it's very curious. Uh, he had a great year. In fact, I just did uh, a film session on him uh, a week ago. And he went from a rookie in another system who was getting exposure, who was playing some downs. Obviously, he was a little bit underwhelming against the run, uh, a little bit more of a concern for the Spagnolo uh, regime because they want their backers to be able to take on the run uh, and still play some coverage. And so he didn't get much play. And then it came to the last couple of games of the regular season last year where they're, they're trying to not only find out what he can do, but have a specific role for him. And so they put him in there in a three-man rush situation where he was actually the spy against Deshaun Watson. And he played very, very well. Didn't have the breakdowns that you've seen before. Obviously, they're in a situation where um, Watson was passing quite a bit. And I think that played into his abilities in particular. But especially knowing that they're opening the season against them again, I could see him being on the field. The question is, will he be, get any playing time yeah. beyond that? Is his uh, primary, if you t if, if you look at it, it looks like he plays a, an awful lot on special teams. Is that also how he's going to be able to keep his roster spot on the team? Absolutely. That, that's needed at this point. I have him as the fifth linebacker making this roster, and he may be the last. I don't know that they keep six. Okay. Uh, up front on the defensive line, Chris Jones, he's the star of this unit. And Frank Clark was brought in uh, in, in, in a trade, a very smart trade. Uh, then you got a few other young guys, whether it's Speaks, Saunders, uh, Passignon. So talk uh, talk about some of these guys, you know, some of the draft picks that we're waiting to, especially with the 2008, we have the 2017 and 2018 second rounders and whether or not those guys are ready to take the next step. The guy that I'm really excited about is Colin Saunders because he showed you some flashes of a guy that I, I think was much more pass rush oriented in college than he, he was against the run. He struggled against the run early last year, but he got it down playing next to Derek Naughty and Mike Pinnell. That helps. Uh, and he, he did get his anchor back. He was able to sustain against that, which bought him more playing time. And now I'm looking for him to take the next step and actually be that penetrative pass rusher that can get some work done next to Chris Jones and give them a one, two punch. He will be the first defensive tackle off of the bench, particularly without Pinnell, uh, who will be out the first two games with another suspension. Uh, Pinnell is specifically a, a run first defender, which I think they have in their back pocket for when they need it. But I think they're looking to get Colin Saunders a lot more snaps. And out at the edges, and this team I think has a lot more options in terms of defensive ends than they do defensive tackles. And they all play a little bit all over the place. I, I do expect, unless his um, current injury, which is supposed to be minor, uh, flares up for some reason, I do believe Alex Okafor will be the starter opposite Frank Clark because he brings you some pass rush, and Spagnola will drop uh, one of the defensive ends from time to time, and I think he's specifically suited for that to be kind of the guy who can drop the best of the group that they have. Okay. And then right behind him will be Passigno, who I think we've seen a, a steady progression from him, but he really took a big step last season. And I think he's positioned with Taco Charlton to be the two guys that come in on the field in relief of the starters that can bring some pass rush. And we've seen both in Dallas for Charlton and last year with the Chiefs that they can both play inside as well. So you can get a NASCAR package with Chris Jones is the only down lineman and rush three other ends. And I think that's something that C. Spagnuolo and, and Brendan Daly are really looking to accomplish. They have some younger guys in that mix, too, including Mike Dana, uh, who just left Michigan. He played mostly at Central Michigan, as well as uh, the aforementioned Breland Speaks, who I think is clearly on the roster bubble right now. Uh, I don't know that he's got the speed off the edge. He did slim down quite a bit after his injury, uh, but he's got a long road back. By the way, what about that uh, undrafted kid, Wharton? For Sean Warden. You know, there's been some buzz ar around him lately, and I actually have him making the initial 53 while Pennell's out because just as a, a sheer numbers thing, they don't have a whole lot of depth behind Saunders, the number three tackle. 
I think they need somebody that can play a little bit of pass rush and a little bit of, of rundowns. I think he will probably be there okay. until Pinnell returns, and I think he'll probably go to the practice squad thereafter. And is can you – let's see. That's one of the top performers as far as rookie free agents. Do you have any others that have stood out? The free agents have had a rough go. Uh, I think we all know that this this particular offseason has just been terrible on those who weren't able to put any game film out there in the preseason. Um, a couple of guys are still there. Uh, Darius Harris is still around. Mo Harris is still around. Two guys at the, the linebacker DN kind of positions okay. that are that are smaller, that are a little more speed based. We'll see if they stick. Um, Lavert Hill is a guy out of Michigan that played well, um, particularly uh, against the ball in college that I have high hopes for, but he hasn't quite kicked yet. Uh, Bo P. Keys was drafted rather than a UDFA, and I, I think his grade was probably more along the UDFA lines, um, who kind of jumped him there because of the investment. So I'm hoping he makes the practice squad. I do feel like he has upside the game too. All right. And as far as special teams is concerned, well, really, we could have probably – I mean, we, we, we should have really led with Tommy Townsend because he was oh, of course. he was undrafted and he's going to have a big role with the team as the starting punter, correct? He is. Uh, you know, it, it's been a very long time since someone not named Colquitt punted this for this team. And uh, that's going to be a transition. But I think they're happy with the leg. I think they're happy with his progression so far. Um, I, I do believe he's going to handle the kickoffs as well, as far as I understand. So okay. if Dave Tobe's giving you that kind of confidence, I have to feel pretty confident about it as well. Yeah, and the, look, the Chiefs have had one of the best special teams in years. So it's, it's not just the fact that the Chiefs' offense is explosive. It's that they have a really good special teams unit. And Butker had a big year last year. Uh what about and and Hardiman? Is he just that's it? He's going to be right now. There's no reason to think that he's not going to be the primary kick and punt returner. Or he's, he was a better kick returner, wasn't he, than a punt returner? I think so. I think they want to leave the punts uh, when they really need it to Hill. And I think they have a couple of guys in. If, if Fortson does make it, Pringle's done some returns. They've got a couple of DBs that I think they want to try out there as well. I think the goal would be to try to reduce the return load on McCole Hardman to try and emphasize the offensive side of it. But I think that's going to be a couple of year progression to the point where he's like Tyreek, where he doesn't have to do the return duty. So I think they'll mix in a few others. And who else would be, so you think Pringle has an opportunity to be the number one punt returner? I think he has an opportunity. Yeah. I think it still will be Hardman for the most part. It will be in the beginning. Okay. Got it. Yes. Yes. But, but the idea is is to eventually have somebody replace him at punt returner, maybe keep him as the primary kick returner. Yeah, possibly. I, I think it'll be dependent, honestly, on, on matchup and load and what they're trying to do. I don't see him playing a whole lot where they, they try to move him around to, say, lining up at the X more until maybe next season. So I do expect him to have the slot duties pretty much wrapped up. And, and I think that allows him a little bit more playtime on, on the returns this season. OK, and. Let's see, Damian Williams, the fact that he opted out, and you mentioned Daryl Williams is the number two. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this, uh, one, this last question to you regarding fantasy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are super high fantasy-wise in Edwards Hilaire. Why not? Mm -hmm. First round draft pick, Damian Williams has opted out. He's going to get a lot of touches. But where would you, where would you put Daryl Williams? Do you think he's going to get a lot of touches as the number two, or is it one of those things where he starts off as the number two, but it could easily be where, hey, you know what? Any any given week, DeAndre Washington, DeAndre Washington might be able to pass him, or uh, maybe Thompson gets some touches, that kind of thing. The number two job, maybe not at, even though Hilaire, as you mentioned, he's a rookie. They're not going to try to overwork him. The number two position is going to be a little bit more wide open. Or do you think Daryl Williams has a shot to really be entrenched most of the season as the number two guy? I think Daryl will be your number two. I think there's a, a quite a big gap okay. between Daryl and Clyde and the other guys. All right. Sounds good. And how's the how are the fans taking to I know no what what are what is the fan situation in Kansas City? They're going to do 22% of the stadium in, in the pod structure. I think it's four to six 
is the limit. And they're going to socially distance those groups. So it works out to about, I think it's 16.6 thousand in the stadium on a given Sunday as it works right now. And that starts Thursday night. It does. Okay. And then we'll see. Okay. And overall, how's the, you know, what's the mood is first year Super Bowl champs. It's uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, Fifty years for those fans that were there in 1969 and when it all started. And uh, the optimism I don't think could be any higher to the point where uh, there's a little bit that needs to come back down to reality. There there are still some problems uh, with the roster that will need to be overcome, some adaptations. But uh, very very confident in the Chiefs' ability to not only make a playoff run but to get back to the, the Super Bowl. Now, who do you think is going to be their toughest competitor in the division? In the division, it's I think it's kind of a toss-up, but I think it all depends on how the Raiders' defense comes together. I feel like right now the Broncos are ahead in that area. Yep. They both added a lot of speed on offense to try to combat the ability to score points. And I actually like uh, the Raiders group pretty well, but I, I like the Broncos' receiver group a little bit better. So I feel like there's an edge there. I think if I had to flip a coin, because it really is 50-50 for me, I would probably lean Raiders to be the second out of the West. Yeah, I'm kind of leaning that way myself. I, I don't think Gruden gets enough credit. And it'll be interesting to, to see who wins and holds on to that quarterback spot, though. I mean, I think so, too. This is it for Derek and Carr. It has to be. Last I would think so. And credit to Mike Mayock, because unlike years past, he went out and made sure that if it is a stumble on Carr's part, he's got a viable option yes. that he can keep the ball rolling for them. And that's that's a big step up, I think. Yeah, and I think they did want to also go out and get themselves a, a, a quarterback, but maybe they just didn't – it wasn't the right year. And But you, you kind of get the feeling that they're – may, maybe next year. If, if, they don't, if they're not satisfied – you know if they're not satisfied with the quarterback play this year, they're going to definitely go big time at a, at a quarterback. And it may not be – and this whole draft situation at this point is going to be crazy. Uh, I don't even, I can't, I mean, do you follow college football much? I, I do uh, after the, the playoffs. Oh, when the draft comes around. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing. I think it's going to be nuts right now with the whole draft process, because we don't even know if now all of a sudden is the big 10 going to play. And if they do, when are they going to play? And how is that going to affect the top players saying, nah, it's I'm not going to play. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's going to be crazy. And I don't even know. I, how do you take what was a, an up and coming player, somebody that you projected to be a, worth a first or second round and then totally guess if they don't have a season? I, I don't know how, how personnel departments are going to go about. Yeah, that. it should be interesting because I think that because because uh, what you'll be doing if if it doesn't affect the player is you'll be then letting the other players know, hey, I could I could sit out. Didn't affect my his his draft status. That would be the worst thing for fans mm -hmm. if that happened. We don't want to see that oh, happening. Yeah. Uh, no, you you want to keep the college football the, the feeder system that it is. I think that that hurts everybody, especially you don't want to get more raw prospects even as rookies, right? So let them continue to develop. You want to push that to keep them in college, I think. Ryan, appreciate it. Locked on Chiefs podcast and quickly Rogues Analytics. Tell us about that. And if anybody's interested to find out about it. That's my system developed over a, a number of years in strength and conditioning for the evolution of Spark, basically doing analytics based off of athletic testing that can give you insight into what a player's capabilities are, that whether they show it on film or not might be there. Uh, it's a really interesting prospect. Uh, of how you go about player evaluation in the modern era. Ryan, I appreciate it. Looking forward to talk Chiefs football during the season. Can't wait to do that, that's for sure. Yeah, this should be a lot of fun. Thanks.